Good to see everyone this morning after what I know was a busy week for so many of you. Uh, I know a lot of you were able to make it out each and every night to hear Brother Sammy and uh, several things I wanted to just briefly before we get into the Word. While I'm talking, you can go ahead and turn again to John chapter 20. Uh, John chapter 20 is going to be our focus this morning as we finish up this chapter, but uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for your generous love offering uh, for, our, for our brother. Uh, I was very encouraged, and, and I know he was as well. I wanted to express his thanks, but I just wanted to thank you as a church family for your generosity. Uh, secondly, uh, I wanted to thank you for uh, your hospitality. Uh, so many of you gave a lot of time over, over three separate weekends as we hosted this uh, Counseling Discipleship Conference and uh, it, it did not go unnoticed by our sister churches and by our guest speakers who came. If, if you were here at the end, you would have heard our, our guest speaker just sharing his thanks for uh, the hospitality that you showed. And so I want to, uh, as your pastor, just say thank you for the ways that you helped and served. Uh, it was a lot of time and energy that you put in, and, and, and it did not go unnoticed. And so I wanted to say thank you for that. Um, couple things. One, I have been asked this week about uh, Amendment 3. All right, I don't tell anybody how to vote anything, but I've been asked a lot this question, so I thought I would just say that it's okay. All right, it's, It has to do with incorporation of churches, and people are going, what is that, and, and is it okay? And it's okay. I'm, I'm not going to tell you how to vote or not vote, but I just want you to know we are the only state in the nation that does not have the ability of church, churches to incorporate, which just allows them to be a legal entity, and it protects the protects you, and it protects the leaders in the church from a litigious society. So I'll just say that it's, it's okay, all right? There's nothing wrong with this, um, the, with uh, the amendment that they're proposing. So, uh, and then thirdly, it's my opportunity, Pastor Troy had this a few weeks ago, it's my opportunity to say from my family to you, thank you uh, for the cards and the gifts and um, the ways that you showed your appreciation uh, we were overwhelmed, as always, and uh, it has been a joy for me to serve as your pastor, and uh, it has been an incredible place for me able to, to, to be able to raise my family, and, and so I can't tell you how thankful I am for the privilege of pastoring and serving here, um, and, and I want you to know how much I love you, and I appreciate the, those expressions, some of those cards uh, I take and I, I treasure and I save and I pull them out on hard days because you know there are hard days. And, uh, and it's one of the things I'm so thankful. So many of you come in and you say, Pastor, I prayed for you. Either I prayed for you this morning or I prayed for you this week. And you don't know how much that means uh, because I need it. And, and we need it. Your leaders need it. And so I wanted to say thank you this morning to each of you. Um, and so with that, let's get into the word. All right, John chapter 20, uh, we're going to resume our verse-by-verse -verse study of this gospel, and you already read it, right? so uh, uh, Gary read it as our scripture meditation this morning, so we're not going to reread. We are looking at a very familiar character, one who has throughout time come to be known, I suppose, somewhat notoriously as Doubting Thomas. And, and I'm, I'm not sure that that's really a fair title. Uh, in fact, what we're going to see as we look at our passage this morning is Thomas is going to move from doubt to faith, right? He's going to move from unbelief to belief. In fact, giving one of the highest, probably the highest expression of faith in any of the Gospels. Uh, and so uh, how would you like to be known just from one snapshot in your life, right? Like that's forever how you will be known, Right? That's what has happened to Thomas. They know him as Doubting Thomas. How would you like to be like, like Lying Roger? Right? He's, that's, that's, you know, like, I don't want to be known by one moment in time. And, and, and so the, you know, we're not going to refer to him as Doubting Thomas, but we do find Thomas in a state of doubt. And we recognize that doubt is a very real part of life and faith. And in fact, if, if you've never had any doubts, then I doubt that you have went very deep in your faith. Right? And, and, and so maybe you, you say, yeah, I believe, but you haven't had those seasons of doubt and questions, and you probably haven't thought carefully about what you believe. Uh, because they come. 
Right? And, and, and doubt takes many different forms, and I recognize, even as we have gathered here this morning, maybe there's those of you who are listening today online, and you are wrestling with doubts, doubts about your faith, doubts about God. And, 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 and so I, I, I say, first of all, I hope you are wrestling. Right? Wrestling is a good thing. Right? The struggle is, is, is right. It's when you stop wrestling and you settle in your unbelief that you are in the greatest danger. Right? As long as you're wrestling, as long as you're fighting, and, and, and I'm glad, right? in fact, if you're doubting this morning, you are in the right place because there are answers to your questions. Right? I have no, no apologies for what we believe and who we believe in and I just want to ask you this morning, if you're doubting, are you open to hearing what God has to say to you this morning? Right, if you're here today and you are wrestling with doubt, are you open to hearing God speak? Right, so maybe you're here and you're, just, you're settled. I said doubt takes many forms. There is what I would call a determined doubt. That you could be so settled in, in what you say, like, there's nothing, preacher, you could ever say that would convince me that the Bible is real or that God is true. Right. You may be very determined in your doubt. You know, maybe you're one of those who would just say, I, I, I can't buy into that, and I'm not going to check my mind at the door, and I'm not just going to accept whatever you say. But if you would say there's nothing you could say, well, that's not very honest, is it? That's not very honest seeking, not very honest searching, if you would just say, I, nothing you could say or do would convince me. So if you're determined this morning, I want to just invite you to maybe let your guard down a little and hear the word of God. There is a determined doubt. But there's also what I would call a defiant doubt. Defiant doubt, defiant in the sense that if there's not a God, then I don't have to obey him. <laughs> Right, So I, it, 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 it's easy whenever you can just say, I don't really want there to be a God. And, and it, if there's not, then I don't have to obey his rules. I don't have to obey his laws. And sometimes people will, they will start out in faith. And as they, as they dip their toe in different areas of life, and they feel like, you know what? I would rather have this than I would rather have God. And what happens is they say, I'm not even sure that there is a God. I don't know if I believe in that God, the God who tells me do this and don't do this. I don't, I don't want that God. And so there's a, a doubt that begins to come into your life that is really rooted in a desire for sin. I don't want to listen to anyone. I want to do what I want to do. Right? So it's, it's a defiant doubt. There's also what I would call a developing doubt. Right? And this is a natural part of, of life as you grow in the faith, particularly right, children, teenagers who have grown up in the church. Some of you sitting in here this morning, there's going to come a time in your life where the, this faith is going to have to become yours. There's going to be seasons where you're going to ask those questions. Do I really believe what my mom and dad believe? Right? Is 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 what I have been taught and what I've been told. Is it true and is it real? And those are good questions to ask. There has to be a time in your life, and we're going to see that in our passage this morning, as Thomas cries out, my Lord and my God. It has to be yours. It can't be your parents' or your grandparents' faith. There's a developing doubt. Maybe you're there this morning and you're saying, do I really believe this for myself? And, and, and prayerfully, you are open to hearing the word of God. And, and you could, as, as we see this transformation take place today, you could leave here saying, I believe. I believe. I'm convinced this faith is mine. Right? And there's, there's doctrinal doubt. Doctrinal doubt is simply there are truths and propositions about the Christian faith that I'm just not sure if I can get behind. Right? I mean, yeah, the doctrine of eternal suffering, that God would send someone to hell forever and ever and ever. I have a hard time believing that. How could God send my neighbor, this good, wonderful neighbor who never really seems to do anything wrong, but she doesn't believe. She's not a Christian. She's a good person. How could God send someone like that to hell? I just, I don't, 
I don't understand. Maybe it's not the the doctrine of suffering, but it's just the doctrine of of the goodness and and the power of God, right? People talk about an all-powerful, all-good God, and you say, if God really is all-powerful and God really is good, then why is there so much suffering in the world? I don't see how I can put these together. And so you're you're looking at truths and you're saying, I don't know how I can put these. And, and, And the reality is this, there are things... And you should expect this if you're honest. If God really is God, there are things about him that you should not understand. His ways are higher and his thoughts are higher than ours. He is God and we are not. And there are things that he sees and knows and does that we do not see and understand. But are you honest and open in wrestling with those things this morning? Because I I believe what we see in our passage reconciles many of those questions. Again, we're not ashamed of the faith, right? This faith that has been once for all delivered to the saints. You say, I I don't know, I'm doubting. Maybe you're going, I wasn't doubting, but now after listening to you, I'm doubting. I don't know. There's also a disappointed doubt. And and, and this this happens whenever, whenever God doesn't work the way you thought he should work or whenever life doesn't happen right things things have happened in your life that you don't think they should have happened that way and so you're looking at your life you're looking at your circumstances you're looking at your situation and you're saying if there's really a God things wouldn't be like this God how could you let this happen Right? I mean, and so you, you, you've prayed and you've asked God to move and to act and it doesn't seem like he's hearing and it doesn't seem like he's there and you have just become very disappointed in God. And you start to question. And, and, and I, I finish with that one simply because that's where we find Thomas in our passage this morning. He's disappointed and he's doubting. And maybe you can relate to that this morning, right? Things have happened. It happens as a result of loss, as a result of trauma. It happens as a result of just the disappointments of of life. But you believe, but now you're not so sure you believe. And and so I want you to to listen carefully as we look at the the story here concerning Thomas. Because we're going to see him move from this doubt to deep faith. Right? And, and that is something that I think all of us, you know, you're here this morning, that's what you're wanting, even by your presence here, unless you are just in that defiant doubt saying, no matter what you say, preacher, I'm not going to believe. But most of you are saying, I want to believe. Maybe you're like the father who's saying, I believe, help my unbelief. But this morning you're saying, Lord, help me. And so I think that there's help for you in the word of God this morning. But I want you to put yourself in Thomas's shoes just, just imagine, right, because Thomas is one of the twelve, right? He's one of the disciples who walked with Jesus, and Thomas was all in. When I say all in, I mean he was a true believer, right? He was with Jesus all the way. You remember back in chapter 11 when Jesus said, we're going to go and we're going to see Lazarus, and all the disciples were like, Jesus, that's not a good idea, Right, that's really close to Jerusalem, and they're looking for you, and if they find you, they're going to kill you. And Thomas says, let's go and die with him. Right, I'll follow you anywhere, Jesus. I'm with you all the way. Right? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. That's Thomas. That's, that's who he is. He's a believer. He is all in. And yet, yet he's, he's walked with Jesus, and he's seen the miracles. Right? He was there when Jesus walked on the water and fed the 5,000. He, he was in Lazarus' home and saw Lazarus who was dead and then was alive. The miracles that Jesus performed, the words that he spoke, Thomas had first-hand eyewitness account, and he believed. Even when Jesus was arrested, right? I mean, you think about that week that Thomas just, just went through. They walk into Jerusalem, and all the people, the crowds are chanting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Thomas is going, this is it. This is what we've been waiting for, right? They're going to crown Jesus king. We're go- this is what we've been waiting for. 
And then a few days later, he's arrested. And then he's standing before Pilate, and Thomas is going, I don't know what's going on here. And then, as quickly as it started, he's on the cross. And even as Jesus is hanging on the cross, I imagine that Thomas is thinking, I wonder what he's going to do now. Right? I mean, he's seen Jesus do some pretty incredible things. And he's probably thinking, angels are coming. Right? Jesus is going to be delivered. He's going to call Elijah. He's going to call fire down from heaven. And he's just going to burn up these Roman soldiers. And he's going to get down from the cross. I mean, we've seen him do some pretty incredible things. But then, the earth went dark. And it quaked. And the curtain and the temple was torn in two. And Jesus died. He died. And Thomas, he saw it. He believed. And, and, and in that moment, I'm sure he's thinking, I was such a fool. How could I have believed? How could I have thought that, that he was the one, that he was the Messiah? He's dead. It's over. I think, and we, we may speculate some, I think that's where Thomas is at. He's disappointed. He's despondent, disillusioned with what he thought God was doing and what has actually happened, was right in front of his face. And, and maybe you're there this morning. Maybe. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're strong in your faith. But wherever you're at, I want to encourage you, this word of God is here to help you this morning. All right. So even if you're strong this morning, there are coming days where the ground is going to shake beneath you and your faith will waver. And you're going to need these truths. Or, or, as the people of God, we have been commanded to take up the shield of faith right? as, as his people. And that shield is not the small, personal, individual shield, right? We, we saw in our study of Ephesians, it's the big, wide shield that you stand shoulder to shoulder with your brother or sister, and you shield wall, right? My brother or sister can't hold it up on their own, but I'm going to help them. Right, so if you're here this morning and your strength, your faith is strong today, then you hold up your shield of faith for the one next to you who maybe is struggling today. But we're going to look here, right? The first thing I want you to see that Thomas is doubting, right? In verses 24 and 25, and that's better than doubting Thomas, right? This is not who he is. It's what's happening in his life at this moment. So in verse 24, it says, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, we don't know. We don't know why Thomas wasn't there. Right? We can speculate. We can say that he was disappointed. We can say he wanted to be alone. Right? When you're hurt, when you're hurting, many times that's how you feel, right? I don't want to be with anyone. I just want to be alone. We don't know that though, right? Maybe Thomas was just getting lunch for the guys when Jesus showed up. I mean, the, the truth is we don't know why he wasn't there. It's not necessarily helpful for us to speculate. What we do know is it's Sunday, right? It's the first Easter Sunday. The disciples are hiding together and Thomas is not there. And because he's not there, he misses out. Right? Pastor Troy opened up that passage a few weeks ago as Jesus entered into the room to the disciples, even though it was locked, and showed himself to them. Thomas wasn't there. And I know it's not the main point of our passage, but I do think it's worth mentioning that it's not a light thing to miss Sunday. Right? It, it is the Lord's Day here. Thomas is not there, and he misses, he misses what God is doing because he's not there. Don't take lightly when you miss Sunday. I know it happens. But, but think about what you might be missing, what God might be doing. I know it was a busy week and there were, some of you couldn't be here on certain nights, but man, God was working. God was working in hearts and lives this week. We saw some testimonies throughout the week that were so encouraging. We saw some decisions that were made by our young people. God was working. Right? If, if you're not here, you miss it. 
And that's what happens to Thomas. He's not there. But I want you to notice, right, the disciples here, they don't keep it to themselves. Right? They're not like, ha ha, Thomas, yeah, he, he didn't believe. He should have been there, but he missed it. What do they do? No, it says the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. I don't know about you, but I have some people in my life who are struggling with doubt. They're wrestling. How do I handle that? What do I do? How should I? Well, I keep on telling them. I keep on telling them what God is doing. I keep on sharing with them. Right? That's what the disciples do. They don't close Thomas out. They say, Thomas, you're not going to believe what happened. And Thomas, he doesn't believe. <laughs> Right? Verse 25, he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Now there's a difference between, right? Because he says, I will never believe, right? There's a difference between decided unbelief and doubt. Thomas does not say, I will there's nothing that convinced me, right? He doesn't say, that there's nothing you can say, there's nothing you can do. No, he says, if, and really all he wants is what they got. Right? A week before, they got, the, they got the evidence, right? They were in the upper room, Jesus showed up, he said, see my hands. Right? See, the, see, see where I was pierced in my side? He, Jesus showed them the scars. They saw. And Thomas says, that's what I need. If I'm going to believe, I need to see what you saw. Right? He's not asking for more than what they already got. He's open, yes, skeptical, yes, doubting, yes, his faith is wavering. But what I appreciate is that he's there. He's, he's there now with the other disciples. One week later, it says eight days, but including that day, this is Sunday again, right? They're gathered together in the upper room, and Thomas is there. And so it says eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. See, Thomas hasn't given up completely. He hasn't completely said, I, I, I'm an unbeliever. I've, I, I, I'm not in on the faith anymore. No, he does what anyone should do when they're struggling with doubt. He gathers with other believers. And this, dear friends, I'm just going to tell you right now, is one of the most difficult things when you are hurting and you're struggling in doubt. Because many times you're going to want to do what Thomas did. You're going to want to not be there. I don't feel like being around other people. I don't feel like being around those Christians. You're always smiling, always happy. I'm not happy. I'm not, I don't want to be there. But Thomas is there. And because he's there, God is going to meet him in his doubt. And so I, my encouragement to you, and I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning, but my encouragement to you is in your doubts and in your struggles and in your weakness, make it a point to be there. Right? To, even when you don't feel like it. I know that goes against everything the world tells you, right? The world says, do what feels right. Do what feels good. But the Bible is constantly telling us to cross our wills and do what we don't feel like doing. And there's going to be times where you don't feel like gathering. And in those moments, you need to more than ever. And Thomas is there. He's gathered with these other believers. And they haven't cast him out. They haven't, they haven't said, Thomas... We thought you were one of us, but I guess you're not, so get out of here. No, they're saying, come on, Thomas. We saw him. And, and, and what happens? Well, we see. Jesus is going to make the same miraculous appearance as before. Right? Thomas is gathered with his disciples. The doors are locked. And it says, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, Pastor Troy got to kind of unfold that, just how incredible it is that Jesus comes into that locked room. But I want to point out the words that Jesus says here. Peace. Peace be with you. Now perhaps, right, 
just a standard greeting. It is a standard greeting. But isn't it so much more? To these disciples who have went through what I would say is the most tumultuous time in their life. They're, this is the greatest storm that they have ever faced. And they are sitting at the end of a week in which they're still huddled in this room. And Jesus shows up and he says, peace be with you. He doesn't say, oh, you of little faith. Right? There's no rebuke here. Jesus graciously offers them what they need most. He is the Prince of Peace. He has the ability to give you peace that passes understanding this morning. Perhaps that's the word that you need to hear today. Peace to you in the midst of your storms and your trials. Jesus is offering grace. Even if maybe you're doubting this morning, you're going, Christians don't doubt. Oh yeah, we do. Right? We are people of faith. Yes, we are people of faith, but we struggle, right? We wrestle. We, we get, Jesus talks about weak faith and little faith. Sometimes we find ourselves there. And yet, wherever you find yourself this morning, there's grace for you. Jesus says, peace. And then, I love this, he just turns his attention to Thomas. I really, I really wish I could just read a room like Jesus. <laughs> He enters into the room and immediately, like, zoom, laser focused on this man who was not there the week before. And he knows. He knows what Thomas said. He knows what Thomas was thinking. And so Jesus looks at Thomas and he says, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand. Place it in my side. Can you imagine? Thomas, look. Here, take your hand. Put it here. Don't, don't, right, right? Do not disbelieve, but believe. With divine omniscience here, Jesus knows what Thomas has said. He knows what he thought. He knows his heart. And he just says, right here, Thomas. See my hands. Go ahead. Put your hand in my side. And we don't know. Did Thomas even go through with it? It really doesn't say, does it? What we know is his response to the words of Jesus who shows the scars, the wounds of the cross. And, and Thomas answers him in verse 28, my Lord and my God. To the wounded Savior, my Lord and my God. At this is the climax of the Gospel of John. Right, we spent a lot of time working our way through this book, all of it building up to this point, this, this declaration of faith. Right, This has been John's purpose all along, that you may believe, and in believing have life. And so now, John has taken this account of Thomas, the doubter, the one who is unbelief, and the movement to faith. In this incredible exclamation, my Lord and my God, and he's made that the pinnacle of the gospel here. These are the words that we need to leave with ringing in our ears. This is who Jesus is. There is no greater, there's no greater description of the identity and the person of Christ than right here in this gospel. He is Lord. He is God. But it's more than just a set of facts, right? Thomas recognizes Jesus for who he is. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the true Messiah. He is the Son of God. Right? This goes all the way back to the very beginning of John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Right? And in verse 14, that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then in verse 18, it says what? We beheld, we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Thomas says, my Lord, my God. And it's not just Lord and God, it's mine. And that's key. 
Can I ask you this morning, is Jesus your Lord and your God? See, it's one thing to know this in your head, right? These truths. Yeah, I, be- I-, I believe Jesus is-, is God. I believe he is Lord. But it's another thing for him to be yours. My Lord. My God. Thomas, in this moment, all doubt collapses. And he is standing on the solid rock, the firm foundation of who Jesus is and why he has come. He rests his whole entire life on this truth. Moving from doubt, disillusionment to this deep faith. Let me ask you, what is it that moved him? What moved Thomas from doubt to faith? He saw Jesus. Right? He, he, saw, he saw the wounds. He saw the scars, right? So in that moment, all the objections and the arguments came crashing down. And if this morning you can leave with your eyes seeing Jesus, if you can see the wounds, if you can see the scars, if you can see him in all of his glory, in all of his grace, then your doubts and your objections too will fall away. When you see the wounds, your heart is transformed. Jesus looks at Thomas and says, Do not disbelieve, but believe. If you came in this morning wrestling and struggling with doubt, that's Jesus' word to you today. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Look. See his hands. You say, well, that's really nice for Thomas. He got to see, right? Jesus said, here, come, touch, feel, see. I can't do that. But, But can you not? Can you not see the wounds? Can you not see the scars? Can you not see the love of God on display this morning? Is that not what we find with a wounded Savior? With a a God who bears the scars of the cross? This is what the hymn writer, uh, Matthew Bridges, he wrote that beloved hymn, crown him with many crowns. He, He wrote, crown him the Lord of love. How is Jesus the Lord of love? Behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above, and beauty glorified. He says what? Behold, right? The love of God on display in the wounds of the Savior. Do you see the love of God? God demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See the scars this morning. See the wounds of Jesus. So what do we see in those wounds? Well, this, is, this is somewhat stunning to us, right? Jesus is dead, buried, resurrected, glorified body, and yet he still bears the scars. Why? Because in those scars, we see who he is and what he has done. In those scars, we see the, the incarnation that God took on flesh. That this God is unlike any other, right? This is what sets Christianity apart from all other false doctrines, false teachings, false religions. We have a God who is not far off. We have a God who came near. We have a God who entered into our suffering. See the scars this morning. See the wounds of the Savior. We see that He came. We see the compassion of Jesus Not some distant deity. Jesus enters into our suffering. Brothers and sisters, life is hard. We live in a fallen world that is filled with hurt and pain. We see suffering everywhere we look. But we have a God who knows that suffering. We have a God who entered into it. 
We have a God who placed himself in the hands, who humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. Do you doubt God's love for you this morning? Do you doubt, that, do you doubt his compassion? Do you doubt his care? Do you doubt his, his willingness to redeem, to save, to renew? And see the wounds. See the scars. Look with me at Romans chapter 8 real quick. Romans chapter 8. I can't tell you how many times I run to this passage. In times where I'm just not understanding, not sure what God is doing, not sure why he's doing what he's doing. In times where I might doubt, God, are you there? God, do you care? Listen, as the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8.31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, how do we know God is for us? Look at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? How do we know that God is for us? See the scars. See the wounds of the Savior this morning. God did not withhold His Son, but gave Him up for us. So that, verse 33 says, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Rhetorical question. No one. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He who did not spare his own son, how shall he not graciously give us all things? And Thomas, on this this Lord's Day, the second Easter, or the second Sunday after the first Easter, he sees Jesus and he believes, my Lord and my God. And maybe you're saying, you know, if I saw what Thomas saw, I believe too. But I want you to hear Jesus' words. Right? Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said to Thomas, Verse 29 of chapter 20, have you believed because you have seen me? Now, I don't think that's a question. There's no, there's no uh, punctuation in the original. I think it's a statement, right? Thomas, you believe because you've seen. You believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Guess what? That's us. That's you, and that's me, dear friend. Jesus says to those who have not seen and yet believe, they are blessed. Right. Now that's life, right? Blessing is real, full life, lacking nothing. The blessing of God is on those who have not seen and yet have believed. You say, well, on what basis do we believe then? If we do not see what Thomas saw, well, John writes in verse 30, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What is the basis by which we believe? It's the word of God. Right? We believe the word that God has given to us. John says, listen, I could have wrote a lot of things, right? Jesus did so many things, <laughs> I couldn't write them all down. There's a lot of things I could have said, but I said these things. Everything we've looked at in the Gospel of John, moving up to this point, 
He says, this is what I've given you so that you may believe. And in believing, here's the blessing, you may have life. And the kind of life that we've seen described in the Gospel of John is what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I came that you, have, that you may have life and that you may have it what? More abundant. Right? The kind of life that Jesus gives is eternal life, abundant life, a life that begins now and goes on into eternity for those who believe. No, Jesus is not going to walk in this morning and say, here's my hands. But we have eyewitness testimony. Is that not the point? Jesus was seen by these disciples. And again by Thomas. And then again by 500 others we see in 1 Corinthians 15. And again by the Apostle Paul who was one born out of due time. The apostles, what makes them apostles? They saw the risen Jesus Christ. And now they are the foundation of the church. You're passing it down on to us and saying, we saw it. And we hear. And faith, faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of Christ. So the word of God continues to go forth today into our doubts and into our fears and into our disillusionment. And Jesus says what? Do not disbelieve, but believe. What about you this morning, dear friend? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Are you believing Today, are you trusting in Jesus Christ? You know, if you are in Christ this morning, you have eternal life, abundant life. But, you know, it, it, it may be that you have come this morning and you are, you are in your doubt. Your faith was wavering and by God's grace, your eyes have been opened to see Jesus. To see his wounds. To see a, a God. No, no, you don't, under every, you don't understand everything that God is doing, but you see that he loves you. you. You see that he is for you, and you hear his word today, and, and God, by his grace, is moving you from unbelief to belief. Maybe you're like that father who's saying, I do believe, help my unbelief. There's nothing better. If you're still wrestling with doubt, than you to leave with that prayer on your heart. I believe, help my unbelief. The reason those wounds are there is because of our sin. Those wounds exist because we have sinned against a holy God. And God in love sent his son to die for sinners like me, like you, that our sin could be forgiven and we could have life instead of death and hell. But you must believe. Do you believe? Brothers and sisters, I see this passage this morning and my, my faith is encouraged and strengthened as I see the wounds, but I'm reminded of something the half-brother of Jesus said. In, in, in the half-brother Jude, right? In, in Jude, in verse 22, he says this, Have mercy on those who doubt. Have mercy on those who doubt. You're going to come in contact with people as you leave this place who are doubting. And the word of God to you this morning, brothers and sisters, is have mercy on them. Be like the disciples. Tell them who God is. Tell them what he has done. Tell them how he's working in your life. Have mercy on those. Not in some unloving or condescending way, but tell them what you have seen and heard. 
That's what these disciples did for Thomas. Thomas, we've seen the Lord. And if you know him, you could say the same thing. I've seen him working in my life. Share with others what God is doing for you, brothers and sisters. We're going to be dismissed. If I can be of help to you this morning in any way, maybe you're here and you're wrestling and struggling in doubt, I want to, I want to come alongside you. We have, we have brothers and sisters who would love to come alongside you and walk through those hard days with you. If you're here this morning and you need to just trust in Christ and you're going, I don't know what to do. I don't know. I, I want to believe. I need to believe. I don't know what to do. Then please come talk to us. We would love to show you just how you can enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ and experience this abundant life that's found in him. But brothers and sisters, as we leave here, we're entering the mission field. We want to show others the wounded Savior who entered into our suffering and died for our sin that we could have life. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. I believe that this is exactly what we needed today. By your providence and your grace, you have spoken. You know the hearts and the minds of each one here. And so I pray, pray that you would accomplish your purpose, Lord, in spite of me for your glory. May your Holy Spirit move, strengthen the weak, encourage your people, O oh God. And Lord, bring about saving faith in those who are lost. This is your work, and we leave it in your hands. We ask it in Jesus' name, and amen.